to anybody. Okay, good evening, everyone out in Facebook land. I am uh, Scott Hodenstein. I am the president of the Democratic Public Education Caucus of Florida. And uh, we are here with a couple of candidates from uh, Orange County, candidates for school board. We have Heather Ashby and Michael Daniels. So uh, we're going to begin here with uh, in, in a second. The, the format tonight might be a little more formal than what we've done in the past. Uh, each candidate is going to get two minutes to introduce themselves and tell us why they're running. Then uh, we're going to ask some questions from um, uh, a questionnaire that our caucus has prepared for uh, endorsement purposes. And then we will give uh, a chance for people out there in Facebook land to ask questions. And uh, one of our board members, Stephanie Vanos, will curate those questions and give those to us at the end. And if we have time, we'll ask those questions. And then at the end, we will give each candidate about two minutes to sum up and give their campaign info. And if they want to drop any links into Facebook, um, um, that'll be up to them. So um, I think we're up and running. So by virtue of a random guess, um, uh, Heather, you will go first about two minutes to introduce yourself and tell us why you are running for school board. All right, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Heather Ashby. I am running for district two uh, seat in Orange County at the school board. A little bit about myself. I am a 25 year veteran in education. I started in the classroom at age 22, straight out of FSU. I was a social science education major. I taught in a middle school for about four years, and then I moved to high school where I taught world history, regular level, honors, American history. I taught sociology, psychology, and then eventually became an AP psychology teacher. I was a national board teacher. I was a supervisor of interns. I was an AP grader. I, I lived and breathed the classroom. But teaching AP psychology, I really fell in love with the mental health side and my students needing more support. I love adolescents. And so I decided to go back and get my master's degree. And I got a master's degree from Barry University in mental health counseling and also marriage and family counseling. And I thought I was gonna do just that. And I really couldn't leave the schools. So after teaching and then spending my evenings counseling, I decided I needed to consolidate it a little. So my compromise was becoming a school counselor. So I've done that for 10 years and I've worked at several high schools in Orange County um, as a school counselor. Um, and doing that, essentially, I really believe that there, there's a couple of reasons that promoted me to go ahead and run for school board. Number one, my love of public education. It, it's what I live and breathe. It's what I've always done. Um, my husband's a teacher. I'm a teacher. I'm from a house of teachers. Um, education is our lives. Um, that being said, we're under assault. Um, public education is definitely under assault in, in Florida. And I think we need people with experience um, and maybe a little vision, but really also understanding the system and knowing what we can do, what we can't do, what we can do maybe a little creatively. Um, and that's why I'm really running. I, I want to strengthen our public schools, but I really want to protect what we have now. I think a lot of what we have is working really well. And I think with different laws that are coming out of Tallahassee, we are going to have to be really creative in the next couple of years of how do we protect our students? How do we protect them from decisions that are being made from people that are not in the schools? And, and that's what I hope to do as a school board member. Thank you, Thank Heather. You. Uh, Michael, mm -hmm. two minutes, introduce yourself to everyone and tell us why you are running for school board. All right, very good, everybody. My name is Michael Daniels and I'm running for Orange County School Board District 3. Um, I'm uh, probably like a lot of people on this, uh, on this Facebook Live session. I'm an education geek. Um, I've been in higher education for a little over 20 years. I'm currently the college-wide chair uh, for Eastern Florida State College. If you've never heard of Eastern Florida State College, 
think of it as the Valencia of Brevard County. Uh, over there, I oversee the business and education programs. Prior to that, I worked at Nova Southeastern University as the campus director in Orlando. And with both jobs, um, working in higher education, I had a chance to work very closely with K through 12 uh, students. And you see the opportunities um, that are out there where um, students can take advantage of things. Um, I also am married to a teacher. My wife has taught for over 20 years. I have to say she was teacher of the year twice at two different schools. So I have to always give her a shout out. Uh, we have two kids, uh, both those kids have recently graduated Orange County Public Schools, uh, Freedom High School. My daughter graduated in 2019 and my son graduated in 2020. And, uh, you know, we've been pretty fortunate to get those kids through school and get them graduated. But professionally, as I work with in education, you just see opportunities, opportunities where schools can get better. Uh, when you talk with parents, you realize that there's a lot they don't know. And uh, you just want to be a part of the solution in education where you can educate parents, help kids, and just make things a little bit better. So that's why I'm running for uh, Orange County School Board District 3. Awesome. Um, j just from some of what you said, uh, my wife is a school counselor. Um, she got into public education before I did. In fact, um, at, when I retired, it was kind of 50 50. What am I going to do for the rest of my life? And my wife was a school counselor. And I'm like, I taught at the Naval Academy. Maybe I'll teach. And, and, that, that's where I got my uh, start from. And uh, I was actually a teacher of the year finalist over here in Hillsborough County in 2019. Um, and um, what's kind of disturbing about that is there were five of us, none of us are in the classroom anymore. And four of us have left the profession. I, I'm, I, I'm now a full-time advocate and I'm subbing but um, um, we had two people leave the profession in their prime um, because of what's going on. So um, I, I definitely feel you on, on both your, your backgrounds. So um, I'm gonna ask the first question and civics teacher here, um, I have to quote from the Florida constitution. Um, Article nine addresses public education so Article 9, Section 1 of the Florida Constitution says, and I quote, the education of children is a fundamental value of the people of the state of Florida. It is therefore a paramount duty of the state to make adequate provision for the education of all children residing within its borders. Adequate provision shall be made by law for a uniform, efficient, safe, secure, and high quality system of free public schools that allow students to obtain a high quality education and for the establishment, maintenance and operation of institutions of higher learning and other public education program programs that the needs of the people may require. So I'm gonna leave this pretty open-ended and, and I would like for you to respond linking it to what your job will be as school board members, but what does that part of the Florida constitution mean to you? And Michael, I will start with you with this one. Uh, you know, I think that links up with high quality education and inclusiveness. Uh, you know, um, everything that we do in education needs to be made available to everybody. It needs to take everyone's voice into the equation. And, Sometimes, unfortunately, especially with what's going on in Tallahassee, there are a lot of people that don't have a voice. So as a school board member, that's one of my primary roles to be out in the community, listening to parents, listening to students, listening to teachers and coming up with solutions, not making it a, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, sometimes you, you look at the school board uh, meetings or you look at meetings in Tallahassee and it becomes a circus. Um, I really just wanna focus on the task at hand what can we do to make things better, implement those things, and be able to communicate with parents? You know, part of that, the challenge is just communicating with parents, with teachers on the why, and helping them to understand the why. And then sometimes you have to take their feedback as well with you when you go into sessions to make decisions. So 
really ultimately this is all about communication or a lot about communication and ensuring that students, all students uh, get an inclusive education that's high quality. Awesome. Um, Heather, would you like to answer the question, please? Sure. Um, I, I agree with Michael that the inclusive part is, is certainly important. And I've had a little bit of a change in my role in the last year in that I took on all students at our school that have 504s. So my entire caseload is students that for various reasons are under the protection of with disabilities. Um, and in doing that, I've re it's really, really opened my eyes to some of the struggles that students have. And what we just decide is, you know, shouldn't everybody be able to do this? Well, sometimes there are barriers that, you know, make it hard for students to participate like every other student. And, and so I do think looking at, first of all, anything we do, making sure that every student has access is super important. Um, right now, I, I'm very concerned, especially as a school counselor, and I'm sure your wife may feel the same way, what, what is gonna happen with our LGBTQ plus students and, um, and some of the doctrines that are coming down and, and how are the districts going to you know, deal with that and what does that mean for inclusiveness? Um, another term that pops out to me is safe. Um, we want our campuses to be safe and we want students to feel safe coming to those. And there are things that we can do better as far as that is concerned. Uh, definitely on, on campus wide, just like security. And in the last few years, you know, since, you know, school shootings, you know, unfortunately, and, and public shootings have become bigger um, and more commonplace. There are students that are dealing with severe anxiety just with the idea of coming to school. You know, that idea of, will I be safe? What do I do if something happens? And, you know, we practice that in schools now. I, growing up, we practiced for tornadoes, which never happened in Florida practically. Um, you know, now we pra practice active assailant drills. And we worry about if I'm here on campus, where do I go? Our students are living in a world that we never imagined. And the anxiety that that causes, the depression, um, is just not being addressed. And one of my big issues that I'm sure maybe I'll talk about later is, is mental health, of course. Um, but I, that definitely plays into that for me too. So again, you know, ultimately as a school board member, I want to make sure that our students feel good at school, feel safe at school, and feel welcomed at school. And, and that, is, that is the number one thing. Excellent. Um, I, I subbed today, and, and it's, it's kind of funny how everything relates to actual experiences in the classroom. And um, we had an active shooter drill <laughs> um, the Monday of the last week of school. <laughs> so, um, y you know, yeah, during, during testing. We weren't testing at that moment, but during finals week. So, okay. Um, let me uh, ask the candidates, I, I should have mentioned this uh, ahead of time, if you could keep your chat open and as you approach the two minutes, Stephanie will probably put in like a 30 second warning or a 15 second warning. Um, that, that way we're not like, you know, cutting you off in the middle of the answer. We'll, 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 we'll be nice and, and friendly with it. And I don't have any music to, to <laughs> to, to play you off anyway. Okay, so um, I have another question that quotes the Florida Constitution, and uh, th this will be the last civics quiz uh, of the evening. Um, but again, Article 9, this time Section 4B, states that each school district, quote, shall operate, control, and supervise all free public schools within the school district and determine the rate of school district taxes within the limits prescribed herein, end quote. Um, what is, what do you see as your role? How do you support um, this constitutional imperative against some of the legislative overreach that we're seeing in Tallahassee especially um, when it comes to funding and taxes. Um, Heather, uh, I'll let you go first on this one. Okay, so obviously money is, is a huge issue for schools and there have been certain you know, instances lately where 
Um, the legislature has tried to say, like, if you don't do this, um, we're going to withhold money from you. Um, I think as a county, we need to obviously be very concerned with funding, but at the same time, not be bullied. Um, and, and sometimes be able to stand up to Tallahassee if, if what they're asking for is just unjust. Um, I also think as a county, you know, sometimes we have to look for, you know, raises to to get more money into us and we have that control. I know at the last school board member, I mean, meeting when I was at, um, you know, they were looking at raising that and, and approving, you know, that. So I think that that's important to look at the money, but also when it comes to Tallahassee and, you know, saying that school board members aren't going to be paid if we have mass mandates or things like that, then, you know, sometimes we have to stand up and say, okay, like, if we think this is right and this is best for students, like, go ahead, take a shot at us. That's kind of how I feel. Okay. Um, Michael, go ahead. Well, I agree just like Heather that, you know, as school board members, we have to fight very hard and advocate for every tax dollar that's due to Orange County Public Schools. Um, and that's just hard advocating consistently. Um, also, when you, when you phrase the question in my head, I started to think about within the county, our public schools and our charter schools too. Um, you know, I, I'm for me, I'm a public school guy. I, I grew up in public schools, love public schools. I like charter schools too, and it's good to have that choice. But you know, we need to make sure that we are watching, managing uh, those charter schools because they also occupy those tax dollars. And you know, occasionally with charter schools. Some of them do wonderful things. And so we need to be attentive to that and aware of that and where we can uh, capture great ideas. I think we should do that as well. But because they are taking the same tax dollars that our public schools uh, will receive, uh, we just need to manage them and make sure they are up to snuff. Okay. Um... It, th this is a follow-up question more for our understanding. Um, have either of you heard of the rollback rate? Okay. Um, we could talk all about that uh, offline, but um, one of the things we as a caucus um, hear a lot about is how this year, this legislative session, um, it's a uh, record level of spending on public education. Um, so here are some facts, and you might have known this. This this is me more speaking to everyone in Facebook land. Um, we are 13% in inflation-adjusted dollars. Inflation-adjusted. We're 13% behind where we were in 2007-2008. In inflation-adjusted dollars teacher pay has fallen by 7.4% in the past decade, worst in the nation. Um, even with our record levels of funding, um, Florida is 33% below national average when it comes to per pupil spending. And um, our, our entire budget this year went up 10.4% but per pupil spending only went up 4.96%. So public education didn't get like a full slice of a larger pie. So that, that wasn't the question. I just like repeating those facts to, to everyone in the public as much as I can, because um, you all have to fight some bad narratives that you know everything is hunky-dory when it comes to funding. And, and it's not. For Florida to have, if Florida were its own country, we'd have the 17th largest economy in the world, yet we're in the bottom five of funding in the United States when it comes to public education. Okay, so um, Michael, you brought up charter schools, and this question will go to you first, or wait. Prophetic. Yes, yeah, to you first. And, and then to Heather. So the question is, what role should local school boards play in connection with the opening, closing, and monitoring of charter schools? And what role should the Florida Board of Education play in this area? 
So what is your relationship? What should it be um, as a school board member? What should your role be in opening, closing, monitoring a charter sheet? Go ahead. At the local level, it's complete oversight uh, to ensure that the kids there are getting um, the outcomes that they deserve, that the tax dollars that are being spent in that charter school are being used appropriate. I think we've all watched the news and seen a charter school here and a charter school there go under because of poor management. And it's the role of Orange County School Board or the school board to manage those uh, charter schools to ensure that the kids are being taken care of, they're being educated, the money's being spent appropriately, and they're being held to the same standards that uh, Orange County Public Schools, the public schools are being held to. So it's, it's complete and total uh, watchdog uh, role that I think that the local school board plays uh, when it comes to charter schools. Okay, Heather, go ahead. Oh, well, I, I do think that charter schools serve a purpose. And, you know, most charter schools, at least in, in my district that I know are open, um, have, have, a, have a draw, whether their draw is to work with um, students that are behind track or they have a STEM focus, you know, they have something that they're known for. Um, Orange County makes deals with these schools that yes, you can come into our area and you know, you're know you gonna be under our, our umbrella, let's say. If they're doing a good job and they're serving a purpose to the county, you know that can be, that can be good. If you know it's an area maybe that's overcrowded and they're going to help serve our students so our, our public schools aren't completely overcrowded. Okay, great. Um, but they need to do their job. And I'll give you an example of sometimes when they do their job and when they don't. So again, as a school counselor, obviously I'm working with high school students. Um, and you know, graduation rate is something that obviously we want to keep high. We want students to graduate. And sometimes students get off track. And sometimes traditional public schools don't have the same mechanisms to serve those students that are really off track. At Orange County, we're a full credit county. It's hard to pick up little pieces and then you start doing all this credit recovery. It gets messy, so let's just say that. So there are schools that, um, there are charter schools that we have contracts with where students who are behind can go to get back on track. Um, a few years ago, there was a school that was open in Orange County that was terrible. Kids were going there and they were not graduating. And got to a point where we stopped, we stopped saying we should go there. It was horrible. We're like, no, like, I, I don't, that's not the good option. Well, the, the county stopped that contract. They stopped that school and that school folded. They found another school that did a better job. And we use that school now. And I can tell you as a school counselor, I usually have a hundred percent graduation rate. And I'm proud of that. Four of my seniors went to a charter school this year to finish up. I tracked my four seniors. They came back and walked with us. They all finished. So again, that is a charter school doing what we are contracting with them to do. They're supposed to take a kid that's off track and they're supposed to get them a, a diploma. So when a school does what they're supposed to do, I'm fine with them getting some money for doing that. But I agree that we have to, oh, we have, to have that oversight. We have to be proving that they are doing what they're supposed to do, what their purpose is, or they shouldn't be getting any of our money. Excellent, thank you. Um, so let, 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 let me go back to um, charter schools and an experience we had here in Hillsboro. Um, <clears throat> state statute says that you could only close, like local school boards could only close down a charter school primarily if they are not meeting like that they are uh, graded poorly, like a D or F. But it also says you could close down a school if they're in financial trouble, if they're breaking federal or state law, or, um, and, and then there's a catch-all, which is pretty hard to use. So those are the four stated reasons. We had two charter schools that had been in financial difficulties for over two years, and then two charter schools that had documented instances of breaking local, uh, I'm sorry, federal and state law when it came to providing services for students with disabilities like IEPs. You, you know, it, it's the law, and we've got a question on that coming up. Um, so the school board um, voted to close those schools 
And then um, they appealed and it went to the State Board of Education who overruled them. And recent legislation, um, the past couple of years, has actually weakened some of the local school board oversight. They now allow universities to open up school boards and supervise them. And now there's an alternate uh, direct path under the state board of education for charters to use to, to open up, um, which you know goes back to, it wasn't part of this question, but the constitutional issue of, hey, it should be your job to, to do what y'all have described, which is to provide the oversight of these uh, charter schools. Um, okay, next question. Um, for Heather, what does inclusion mean to you? And how would you address bullying and hate in all forms? So what does inclusion mean to me? That means that every student, regardless of anything, deserves a quality, safe, you know, education. And we have to meet those needs. And so when you asked me about, you said bullying or hate, yes. was that the two things? Um, I can tell you in Orange County, there are systems in place. Um, if a student says they have been bullied, if a parent says a student has been bullied, there is a very specific protocol that has to be followed from that point on. So I do think that the, the, on a county level, school by school, it, it is a county policy. And I do think it is addressed. Um, one of the bigger problems we're having right now is having students understand what hate speak is. You know, unfortunately, with this time that we're living with social media, they see things and they think it's just normal. They think that that's how people talk. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, that's not appropriate. And, and so making sure that we are addressing, number one, making sure students understand what we consider to be hate speech. Because again, I don't always think they know. They hear things, they see things, and they don't understand that that might mean something different to me, that that's not just the way you talk to your friend. Um, so I think you have to understand, but then you have to take it seriously. Um, we can't just ignore things. And I can tell you one of the responsibilities that I have unfortunately had is sitting in level four meetings. So those are expulsion hearings. And you know, hearing things that have gone to the top level, and you know, as a school board member, you at the end decide. You know, you rule over those final expulsions. But I mean, I've seen, I've been in parts of the other pieces of it, and I do think as a county, we take all of that very seriously. I do think that um, on the discipline side, they already have a lot of things in step to deal with that. But I also believe that if for some reason a parent, a student feels like those um, policies have not been followed, then that's something where, you know, as school board members, we can intervene and we can ask those questions. Okay, thank you. Michael, um, what does inclusion mean to you? How would you address bullying and hate in all forms? Well, inclusion really means including every and all all groups on a continuous basis. Um, and that, that really boils down to listening to people. Um, you know, everybody has a voice and we as a group, as a nation, we really need to focus on listening to people and hearing their concerns out and making sure that programs and policies in our schools are open to everybody. And the only way you really can ensure that other than monitoring it is, is listening to feedback and listening to what groups say and being responsive to that. So inclusion is, is pretty straightforward. It's uh, including everybody. As far as the hate and bullying speech, I had an interesting uh, comment that was made in a session that I had on Friday. You know, one of the first things we need to do is increase the number of mental health counseling professionals that are in our schools. Uh, when you listen to students time and again, there's not enough. They don't, they don't have enough. They, they don't even know where to go. Um, some of the students uh, that were in one of my sessions didn't know that they can go on a little app on their, on their laptop and just send a message that, hey, I'm in trouble. Hey, there's some bullying going on. So part of this is we've got to communicate better uh, with our students and let them know these are the tools that are at your disposal because a lot of times our students don't know. Again, it's all about communication and letting them know um, what tools are available. Thank you. Okay. 
So the next question, and I'm going to throw some acronyms at you. Um, what would you do to strengthen FAPE? So F-A-P-E, which is a free appropriate public education within the IDEA, which is IDEA, Individuals with Disability Education Act. So what would you do to strengthen FAPE within the IDEA? And how will you ensure um, FAPE and IDEA is implemented within Orange County uh, Public Schools? And, and I gotta tell you, we have a very awesome ESE chair. Um, and uh, this question came from her. So I, I don't know if she's listening or not, but she is always a resource if you wanna get uh, smarter on students with uh, disabilities and policies and what the law says. So what would you do to strengthen FAPE within the Individuals with Disability Act? And how will you ensure these are implemented in Orange County? Uh, Michael, I think you start with this one. I think so. Uh, well, the first thing I would do is talk with those groups, uh, those disabled groups to understand where are the gaps, what services are they not getting? What could we be doing better as a school district? And then try to meet those needs pretty straightforward. That could come through advocacy. Funding is always a problem. You know, I, I, unfortunately, uh, one of the, the go-to answers we can go to time and time again is that there's not enough funding to support some of our um, our ESC or, or extended services out there. So getting more funding, getting more people, more services available to everybody is the key thing. And then listening to um, getting feedback on what, what can we do to provide more services to different groups? Okay, um, go ahead, Heather. So um, I have a little experience in this. I would say that I'm certainly not the expert. So I agree with Michael that, you know, sometimes when you recognize that you are not the expert, you talk to the experts and, and find out what are they thinking. But I can say that in, in the last few years, I have seen some services roll back in our school. Um, due to funding and where we had, you know, maybe more facilitated classes and we dropped some of those. So instead of having a teacher that was in that classroom every day with students with IEPs working with them, in addition to having like co-teaching, they maybe pop in there once a week. So I think there definitely has been rollbacks and, you know, unfortunately that that is a funding issue which obviously we'd wanted to try to improve. But the other side of it is I do believe and I do sit in IEP meetings um, sometimes. I think we need to strengthen some of our parents and understanding what they can ask for. Um, yes, there are those very educated parents that come to IEP meetings and they know exactly what they're looking for. Maybe they're working with an advocate. Um, and I think their interests are very well um, followed, but not every family has that knowledge or the, those resources. And so I think also helping parents understand like, okay, your student has an IEP. These are possibilities. Let's talk about what best will be needed for your student. Um, and really remembering that every time we sit down to an IEP meeting, we are talking about an individual. We're not you know, just filling out tons of forms and there are tons of forms that go with this, but behind all that, there's a student with very specific needs. And so I think looking and reminding ourselves what Let's not be tied into what we can't do or what we can't offer anymore. What can we offer? And, and what, what did the family need the most? What does the student need the most? And I think that's what I would look at. And that's what I'd want us to do as a county. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to manage a timer and the questions and the, uh, some of the Facebook questions are being sent to me and I'm trying to screen those. So I, I got to get better at moderating. Um, so if, it looks like I'm not paying attention. I really am, but sorry. Um, okay, we'll, we'll move on to the next question. Um, do you support the free discussion of LGBTQ plus topics in public schools? And how do you think teachers and administrators, actually educators in general, should address um, potential gender and or sexual sexuality of students, both in class and at home. And I think you're going to want to probably break this down according to age, of course. So 
Do you support the free discussion of LGBTQ plus topics in public schools? And how do you think educators should address gender or sexuality um, issues of students in class and at home? Heather, um, you're first up. Okay, so that's a loaded question that I feel pretty darn passionate about. So, so let me try to stay in my two minutes because I could probably talk for a lot longer. Um, yes, I, I do support um, the discussion of, and yes, I do think it should be age appropriate. Um, if a student, an elementary school student is drawing a picture of their family and they bring it into the classroom and they have two moms in that picture and them standing in the middle, there's no reason why they should not be able to show and discuss their family like everybody else's family. Um, and that is age appropriate to me. And um, honestly, that happened with my children when they were in school. One of their early friends had two moms who didn't know how to tell people that he had two moms and was very, very careful about words he used. And I quickly picked up on it. And then I tried to have that side conversation with my children. So they kind of understood what was going on there. Um, but I think that's appropriate. As we get older, I obviously, I think the conversation can grow. In high school, I think you can have much more open conversations. And we do have students who, you know, are trans in high school. Um, and, and I think, you know, unfortunately we have new legislation that we have not been given clear direction from our district of how we're going to deal with um, some of these rules. But yes, I have students that go by different pronouns and have preferred names. And I've never called a parent to say, hey, did you know your child prefers to be called this name if their name is Maya and they choose to be called Max? Um, but I also don't call them when their name is William and they choose to go by Billy. So to me, a nickname is a nickname, and it shouldn't re-warrant me calling a parent to tell them that. Um, and like I said, I could go on for too long, but I have been told my two minutes is up. Okay. Michael, go ahead. Um, so, and, and let me let me get those two questions again to make sure I answer both specifically, because they're very, very loaded. Do you support the free discussion of LGBTQ plus topics in public schools? And then how do you think teachers and administrators, you could say, how do you think educators should address uh, potential gender and or sexuality um, issues with students okay. in class and at home? So, you know, the first question is yes, a resounding yes. I think we're all on the same page on that one. And the second one is, and this is so, so tricky with what the state has done to teachers. You know, it's not like teachers don't have enough on their plates, enough pressure, enough things to worry about. But now they have to worry about, you know, the, the kind of conversations that they can have with students when they bring things up in class. But I think it's age appropriate. I, I think, yes, I think teachers should be able to have that, that conversation or it should be okay for, for any group to talk about what their home life looks like or anything that's on their mind. I just, I just think teachers have to be, uh, it's sad and it's frustrating that they have to kind of tiptoe uh, around because of a state law. And we're not even quite 100% sure what the ramifications of this is going to end up being. But I, I do support, I always support teachers having those conversations when they can uh, with students. Uh, some, of the, some of the best conversations uh, that I've had in my life are with teachers. And I think that's true in a lot of classrooms. There's a lot of growth opportunities in a classroom. And I am, I am supportive of teachers trying to have that conversation. I do recognize the legal peril uh, that, um, they, that they could put themselves in, but I support them trying to do the right thing and trying to talk to kids. So I'm gonna plug a Facebook Live program that we actually did, uh, I think probably two weeks ago now. Um, and, and it's uh, on our Facebook page or if you go to our YouTube channel. Um, and I don't know if Stephanie, you still have those links and you can put them in, uh, in, in, in the uh, Facebook chat. Um, but uh, I had a former student, I had coached her for three years in middle school, two sports. She was in my civics class, she was my student assistant and we kept in touch. She came back to help coach. Um, when she was a high schooler 
but uh, I was, it was really random. Um, probably two months ago, six weeks ago, um, I was leaving from subbing. She was arriving to help coach soccer. And I'm like, Hey, Morgan, you know, I haven't seen you in a while. I would written her letter for uh, Columbia and um, we're like, we should catch up. And we actually went out to lunch and in the middle of lunch, she, we were talking about what I was doing with the caucus and we were talking about don't say gay. And she was like, um, um, not too many people know this, but I'm gay, Mr. H. And she told me of the hurt um, that the don't say gay bill caused her and how it negatively affected her. And I mean, it's a really powerful story. I said, do you want to share that on Facebook Live? And and she did a couple of weeks ago. So um, both for the candidates and anyone watching, if you didn't see Morgan's story, go check out our YouTube page. And uh, it's about an hour long, um, but listen to it and get the perspective of a student who dealt with this uh, personally. So um, yeah, so that was a plug for a previous program. Um, I think there are some Facebook questions that jive with this. Um, so this next question is about testing. Um, the governor has eliminated the FSA in favor of what he describes as progress monitoring. What are your thoughts on that? And, and I think there's one particular program, um, in, Orange County that uh, gets some talk. I think it's iReady. Um, and uh, we have that here in Hillsboro. I've got a whole long story about iReady. But so what are your thoughts on the recent testing bill? Um, and maybe add in some thoughts on iReady specifically. And Michael, we'll start with you. Yeah, um, you know, I. Full disclosure, I love testing. I love data because there's so much you can learn from. You can learn well, where your pre-test, post-test. You can learn where your where your opportunities lie with students that are at risk, and you can address them. But the problem is, our fearless leader uh, has. I haven't seen anything from him in terms of education that I can trust. Uh, everything that he's implemented uh, just seems to be one more thing that teachers have to worry about. Um, I, I also think it's important that teachers feel comfortable teaching the lesson and not have to teach to the test. And based on this progress uh, uh, piece that the governor's rolled out, I mean, they could be teaching the test multiple times a year now. And that's gonna take away from you know, valuable class time when they can actually be learning about the subject at hand. So I don't, I don't, I don't in a vacuum, this could be a very good thing um, if utilized. iReady is a good tool if used properly and you take the data where you can find out where your opportunities lie with, with kids that are at risk. The, the problem is the execution sometimes, and I, I'm not convinced that this is gonna be executed appropriately. And I think this is gonna be one more thing that teachers are gonna have on their plate unnecessarily. And I, I think it's only gonna hurt kids at the, in, the, in the long run. Okay. Heather, go ahead. So, you know, testing is a loaded question. And I agree with Michael that yes, you can get some information about testing. But I think sometimes that data is trusted more than looking at other key points. Um, I can say definitely within Orange County, I know sometimes there are decisions made as far as like students and what classes they should be offered solely based on, hey, they scored this level on this test. And as a counselor, I've had to argue and say, okay, that's great, but do you know this, this, and this? Because this is why I don't think they should be doing that. And really having to justify and say, no, just because one test said one thing one day. And that is my little bit of problem with the over um, stressing of tests. My other issue with, you know, great, let's get rid of FSA, lovely. Everybody was happy, it was a beautiful headline. But in talking with teachers and how this progress monitoring piece is rolling out, What's been shared with me is it's going to actually be more testing, more days, you know, and, and I look at, you know, how much time are we already losing to testing? It is so frustrating that I literally call May the testing month. 
because nothing else happens in a high school in May other than testing. Um, we lose an entire month of school. And this new plan is actually going to add more testing days to it, not less. And I don't think that's what people expected when they heard that. When I think people originally heard progress monitoring, they're like, great, you know, you're going to check in and see, you know, growth during the year. That in theory sounds good, but it seems like every time we take something that sounds good and then we try to put it in practice, we take two steps back. So that's that's my concern. And again, I haven't seen the full plan of how exactly this new progress monitoring is going to happen. But in talking with specifically some English teachers, um, what it's been shared with them already is that it actually is more testing. What um, my concern is, and, and I'll just give some personal experience of mine. Um, the bill says that the, the statewide progress monitoring will not take up more than 5% of the school year. So that is nine days. So we already, when, when you think about, um, we're doing finals week and you have, you know, a whole week of finals, you have a whole week of semester exams. That's nine, 10 days right there. Um, when it comes to testing, what I've seen is if the state's going to do, you know, the big end of year test, still high stakes, still going to stress the students out, um, that's the third progress monitor. Well, then the district is going to want to know how they're going to do on the state test. So then they layer on some progress monitor. And then the teachers want to know, how am I going to do before the district knows or the school's going to want to know something? And then the teacher's going to want to know something. And, and pretty soon, one progress monitoring test becomes um, four. And, and you're well beyond the 5% um, testing days mandated in the law. Um, but I'm sure they would explain, well, that's just state testing not all the other tests you have to give. Um, I'll, I'll share one last thing. Um, starting, I think, two years before I was teacher of the year, I stopped giving tests in the classroom. Um, they took one test. It was the end of year civics EOC. Um, the last year we had scores. Um, I had six students get a perfect score. 75% got a level five. A lot of that mostly is the demographics of the area where I was teaching. But I think it was also the fact by not giving tests, I so totally increased the amount of teaching I did and more one-on-one -on -one time um, where I was progress monitoring, but you could look at a kid's notes and know how they're doing by the way they write Cornell note summaries, much better than whether they, you know, how they did on a multiple choice test. Personal opinion, um, but you, you all described the, the problems with the new bill very well. And I, can I just add to that? I think you brought up sure. a good point, which is the progress monitoring doesn't have to be a test. Again, you as a teacher were looking at your students and you were watching how they were progressing through the class. You knew what they knew. You knew what they didn't know. You knew what you needed to cover more. And you didn't need somebody else to write a test um, to tell you that. And oftentimes these county tests and things that were written years ago by people who were paid a couple dollars to go sit in a room for a day and crank out a test. And everybody knows it's a terrible test. So when they give it, they just curve it anyway. How is that helping anything? <laughs> it's not helping anything. Okay, you, 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 you got me going. So <laughs> I know it, th this should be about you, but um, I was at a union meeting years ago and, and the, we were talking about testing and this is even before this year's law. And you know the union was like, okay, you, you should expect that you have to give some sort of district test you know, every quarter or if they want a pre-test or something, you know, it's reasonable for you to do that. And there was a teacher who's arguing against it. And our executive director said, well, how do you know how they're doing if you don't give like the pretest or the middle test or whatever we were discussing? And the teacher said, I spend five minutes with the kid 
and I'm and and it goes for any subject. You you give a math problem and just spend time with the kids, see them try the math problem, see them try to write a paragraph, see them write something in civics or perform an experiment in science, and you will know what the needs of the student is far better than a test. And most of the time, the teachers know what's going on um, uh, better than a online test. Um, unfortunately, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a student die. And the next day, we were supposed to be testing. And uh, I went to the principal and I said, you can't test tomorrow. Uh, all the kids are thinking about their classmate. And she's like, you're absolutely right. That's not gonna be a valid result. So she, she postponed and reworked the test schedule. So uh, I'm sorry, I, I feel passionately about testing. Michael, did you want to say anything else? Heather got an extra word in. I just want to yeah, offer that. I, I just, well. again, I, I think we're, we're more or less and, on And the, that's fine, on, you know. <laughs> we're more or less on the same uh, zip code on, on tests, but uh, yeah. Okay. Um, this next question, um, again, is something I learned from a former student. Um, I ran for school board myself in 2018, and one of my campaign managers was a sophomore in high school who had been in my civics class um, um, three years prior. She's now a rising soft, no, rising junior. As a sophomore, she was um, elected president of Greek life in, at UCF, as a sophomore at UCF. Um, she did her AP research project in high school as a junior on sexual assault in high school. Um, so the question is this, what measures would you put in place to reduce the high rate of sexual assault of high school students? And I will give you the last bit of data that we have from 2019 statewide um, I'm not sure if I have Orange County numbers that I could look up and give to you offline later, but statewide, 10.3% of um, female high school students reported being physically forced to have sexual intercourse that they did not want in the past year. 10.3%. So, what would you do um, as a school board member? to um, reverse, to reduce this high rate of sexual assault. And I've actually kind of forgotten, I think Heather, you're first up with this one. Yay. Um, you know, when you, when you said first the question and you said the high rate, I really wondered like, what, what is the rate? Because that's not something that I've ever seen publicized before. Um, obviously I would believe that any you know, instances of, of sexual assault is, is too high. Um, and, and hearing that 10 point, I think you said 10.3% and within the last year, that, that was very yes. striking to me because that wasn't even like throughout high school, that was in the last year. So, so that is concerning. Uh, I'll be honest, I, I had no idea. I don't know if Orange County's rates would, would fall into, you know, something very comparable, but that is certainly concerning. Um, as a school board member, I'd want to look at, you know, how are, how are we talking about safety measures? I don't think that's something that was ever covered when I was in high school, or, you know, maybe it's covered slightly in the curriculum of hope, um, which some students take, even though it's a graduation requirement, some take two years of play a sport and they get a waiver, um, you know? So, you know, I, I would like to think that maybe that's something that we can push out, whether that's in some of these, you know, monthly, like, mental health, you know, lessons and really talking about what does this look like? Um, you know, what are ways to protect yourself? I remember as being a freshman in college, um, if you live in a dorm, you had to go to a little seminar to talk about this and to talk about what were the risks, where you should you be careful, you know, where are you most susceptible? What are the instances in college? But I just haven't seen that ever occur in high school. And so that maybe that's something we need to look at is how can we do something similar with high school. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, um, I guess I could talk about that on a couple different levels. Uh, that The stat that you just said is pretty alarming. Um, 
you know, the first thing is that we, we have that dialogue and that conversation with parents and students. But I, I would say if, if the issue is high school, a lot of the conversations need to start before high school and middle school, possibly even before that age appropriately where we talk about, you know, what is inappropriate touching. Uh, we talk about these issues and these are hard issues. But if you want to fix it, you can't wait till they get to high school to have that conversation. And this is the touchy part. You got to have those conversations before they get into high school so they know. And so that everyone is having that conversation. Everyone's on the same page. And then the other thing is drilling down on the data. I'd love to know that 10.3%, where are those events occurring? Are they occurring in the home? Are they occurring on school grounds? Are they occurring at school-related events? And you know, if they're no matter where they're occurring, we come up with a strategy to target and put people in place to reduce that number. So just a little more information and something everyone out there in Facebook land can do. Actually, if you go to our Facebook page and scroll down a couple of days, I posted a couple of articles about this. That statistic is from the CDC's Youth Risk Behavior Survey. The last results that are posted are from 2019. Haven't seen the 2021 results yet. Um, but recently, Florida, um, I think the governor, maybe it was uh, in the Department of Education, they have chosen to withdraw from the uh, Youth Risk Behavior Survey. So we will no longer continue to get this data. A lot of it was on bullying. A lot of it was on, you, you know, fights at school. Um, it was things like, you know, if you ride a bike, do you wear your helmet? If you're in a car, um, are you wearing a seatbelt? Are you using drugs? So there's a lot of data. I focus on the sexual assault part because my student did the research and brought this to, to my attention. Um, in, high, in middle school, I was a middle school teacher. Um, I had a, a student who, who was one of my favorites, uh, student government. She would come in and chat during passing time with me. And, and I never minded it. And we would talk student government stuff. She was the, the uh, a president, a co-president. But then, you know, class would begin and then she'd say, hey, can I get a pass to so-and-so's class? And um, she would do it once or twice. Then she was doing it like maybe once or twice a day. And finally, I'm like, okay, well, what's going on? You, you know, you need to get to class. And she kind of explained how um, you, we, we had two story, um, uh, a two story building. She explained to me that there were boys who were grabbing her butt on the stairwell. Um, and she didn't want to go through that. And this is middle school. Um, I don't know if you've heard fifth graders or sixth graders talk <laughs> or yeah. some of the things that they say nowadays, yeah. but, um, you, you, you know, um, children and, and, and uh, I'm just making a point. I, I don't think this is a, a question, but, um, you, you know, the, the phones that we have expose children to all sorts of things. Um, that probably worse than any book that you find in the media center. And they're bringing that into the classroom. So uh, I think all of that is contributing to, to the problem. Okay, um, I've got just a couple more questions um, and then we'll go to um, all the Facebook questions that Stephanie's been uh, feeding me. So uh, this next question is, what should happen when a traditional public school shows consistent below average learning and or significant below average graduation rates? Do you support the community school model as one way to address this? So if our traditional public schools are failing our students, um, or, or uh, let, let me rephrase, if they're showing below average learning or significant below average graduation rates, what should happen? Uh, Michael, we'll start with you. Yeah, um, 
you know, this is a tough one because um, there, there are a lot of reasons why schools fail. Um, you know, it could be um, students that for years they've been ignored, they've not been given the resources, they've been excluded. Um, it could be, and, this, and the, the Title I schools that I've visited uh, pretty regularly, it, it could be the attrition. You know, when you can't keep a teacher for more than one year and you get this endless circle of uh, teachers, that could also be a factor. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you've got a failing school, um, you really have to buckle down and put some guardrails in place to make sure that, you know, you're not, you're not um, penalizing the kids that are there. So I do support a, a change in models, a community model. Um, ultimately though, if a school is not successful over an extended period of time, and, and we see this now where the school districts get very, very uh, aggressive in changing administration. Um, you know, when, they, when, when, when there's a state that the state's gonna get involved, they, they get hyper aggressive, but you, you almost have to do that because you can't continue to have a school where um, kids are, are not successful, but I, I feel like the question kind of, you know, forces the the spotlight on the high school itself. You know, it no doubt starts well before the high school, middle school, elementary school. Are those schools? Did they have the resources uh, that other schools did uh, had? So I think there's got to be attention in the entire area and the entire span, not just in the the specific school that could be closed, but yeah, over a period of time, I, I do support uh, a school closing if, if they can't get it right. Okay, um, Heather? So I think when we talk about failing schools, um, you have to, yes, there are a lot of things that lead to that. And I agree with a lot of what Michael said. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, we have to look at who's leading the school. What are they doing? And just because a school is quote unquote, a traditional school doesn't mean that they can't be creative with their approaches to try to reinvigor the students. And so I'd really wanna look at what are we doing in this school to turn things around? Um, you know, what are the, you know, what is, what is the administration doing? What are, what are we trying? What is working at other schools that might have similar demographics that are, that are doing better? And of course, you know, trying to make sure that the same, you know, resources that are available in one school that's finding success is available in another school. So I think all of those definitely need to be explored before we get to, you know, giving up on a school, changing, completely changing the model. Um, I definitely think we need to look at what is working at other schools that are comparable. Cause I don't think there's really any schools in Orange County, we could say they're so unique that there's not another school that would have similar, you know, factors and, you know, really look at that before we say, okay, we, we give up. Okay. Um, the next question at more of a statement, please discuss academic freedom and, and we'll limit this since your school board to K-12 and address things like critical race theory and banning of books. So Heather, we'll, we'll lead off with you. Well, I told you in my intro, I am a social studies nerd. Um, I taught history um, when I was teaching. So do I think we're indoctrinating children? Do I think that there's all these instances of critical race theory hidden in our textbooks? I do not. Um, do I think that we need to teach history accurately? Absolutely. And I think it's hard to argue that certain things have happened. Um, so really that's what I can say about that. I don't believe in revising history at this point. Um, banning books. Honestly, I would, I would be super excited that kids want to read books. So, so let's stop worrying about telling them what they shouldn't read and let's, let's encourage them to read. Um, I talked to our media specialist about what happens and um, Michael could probably weigh in this even more because I know this is what his wife does. Um, but there is a system. If a parent brings a book of concern to the school, the county has a system to review it. Um, there's a protocol already in place to blanketly say that we're not gonna offer, you know, a certain book at a school because somebody deems it inappropriate, then you know, perhaps their child doesn't wanna check it out. But that doesn't mean it's not appropriate for another student. And, you know, everybody has their own story in life. 
and being able to check out a book that they relate to and maybe can make them feel connected to something outside of the walls that they exist in right now, I, I think is a good thing. I mean, for a lot of us that are readers, you know, reading takes you to other places. It, you know, is an outlet. And I think that's really important to not take that away from students when that might be the only way that they can connect to somebody else that's like them, a character that they relate to. And, and so it really makes me uncomfortable when we talk about banning books. Um, absolutely uncomfortable. And I don't think it's something that should be blanketly done. Okay, uh, Michael, please. Uh, so in a word on the banning books, no. <laughs> uh, uh, Heather, yes, my wife is a media specialist and uh, there, is a, there is a great process in place uh, that serves um, our students and our children well really just starts with sitting down with the media specialist. Um, they can either A, go, okay, yeah, I see what you're saying, you're right. Or B, um, they can educate you a little bit about the history of that book and why it's there and the population that does check it out or, or might be interested in it. And it might give parents an opportunity to kind of expand their horizon a little bit um, as opposed to just saying, hey, God, let, let's shut that book down. Um, so that was just a little bit on that one. And um, Scott, help me, what was the other question you had? Critical race theory. You you touched on um, another another topic, uh, kind of tied to critical race the theory. But you know the states basically outlawed it, so it's really not even a thing. It's almost it's almost something that's used to to stir the pot unnecessarily. History should be taught exactly how it happened. But the one thing you you led with Scott that really kind of got my wheel turning is academic freedom. You know, academic freedom is probably the one thing that keeps our, our teachers inspired and coming to work and thinking about what can I do to inspire these kids? How can I think out of the box and not be kind of put in uh, the governor's uh, little uh, prism uh, to, to inspire these kids, to teach them something new? And I think that academic freedom is something that's so important. We have to guard it. Uh, we have to ensure that teachers have as much, granted, they don't have total, we know, we see it, we watch the news, but that they continue to have academic freedom wherever possible, or we're going to see attrition rates fall even worse than what they already are. Okay. Um, last question from us, and then um, I'm looking over some of the questions from Facebook. I'll cover those next. But uh, our last question is how would you address the school to prison pipeline? And then kind of related a little bit, maybe tangentially, how do we decrease the use of the Baker Act? Or, or maybe you disagree with the premise of the question, you, you can let us know. And um, do you support increasing the number of mental health professionals uh, that's probably too easy of a question, but I'll, I'll leave it at that because that's a lot to pack into. It's on uh, my website. <laughs> two minutes. So, M Michael, go ahead. School to prison pipeline, Baker Act, and what you, you know, numbers and of mental I, health I, professionals. I'm, I'm going to work backwards. So, okay. uh, do I support more mental health counselors? Yes, I think we need as many as we can afford and put them in schools from high school all the way down to elementary school. I don't wanna overlook anybody, as many professionals as we can put um, to help kids uh, as possible, that's what I'd wanna do. And again, I touched on this earlier, we gotta let kids know, how do you get a hold of them? How can you reach out to them? You can go to an office or you can go to the app on your computer or you can talk to a teacher. There's a million different ways we can link you with one. So uh, that's important. Um, the other, the other piece uh, that you talked about as far as the school to prison pipeline, you know, again, that, that's, a, that's a tough uh, issue. I, I think a lot of good role models in place um, are important. Um, a lot of getting community leaders out to show kids, um, hey, these are, <laughs> these are some viable options. You know, if you, if you do this, if you take these suite of classes, you can make more money than you could you could ever imagine. I, I just think that there need to be more role models, more discussions with our kids to, to help show them what options are available out there. Because a lot of times they don't know. They're trapped into this idea of, oh, well, this is how, I, well, this is what I got to do uh, to, 
make a living or pay or, or support my family and it's unnecessary. Uh, the Baker Act question is a, is a tricky one because you know I've seen that used in different situations. And sometimes when you're a police officer or you're a mental health professional, you, you make a call because you're either concerned about the safety of someone else or the individual that's in question. So I don't know if the, the I don't know that I'd wanna jump on the reducing Baker Acts or how often it's used, but I definitely would support more mental health counseling professionals in place that could perhaps uh, be guardrails before we get to the point where the Baker Act needs to be uh, implemented. Okay, um, Heather, please. Okay, so I'm gonna work backwards as well since you know <laughs> that's what we just established. So first off, more mental health counselors, more counselors all over, that is one of my big things I'm promoting. It's all over all of my um, publications, my website, all of that. Yes, more, 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 more. Um, and, and in all schools, um, there's disproportionate caseloads in schools. So some schools just have more resources than others. And I think that needs to increase. In a lot of high schools, we have safe offices. Every middle school doesn't have that necessarily. And for those of you that don't know what the safe office is, it, it's a place where kids can go and literally saying to a teacher, I need to go to safe is like the code word. It's not like super tricky. And they, yes, you may go to safe. And, you know, that is a place where students can talk to somebody if they need to, or just have a quiet moment to themselves to regroup. Maybe they have their own personal counselor and they've worked on, you know, this is what I need to do when I'm feeling over anxious, but they just need a quiet place to go. And I'll tell you again, um, being a 504 um, counselor, I have students that I find out like they're hiding in a bathroom for an hour. No, 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 no. We need to have eyes on you, but we wanna enforce you. And that's not where you wanna hang out. So they go to the safe office and we have a safe coordinator there. They can attach them to um, different resources if they don't have those already established. Or again, they can have that time. We have our school social worker who's also in that area. So there are resources on that. To go to your Baker Act, do I think there should be less? In a beautiful world, I'd love to think we don't have students that are in crisis, but I'm okay with Baker acting. And I will tell you, I think post COVID, we've had more Baker acts at my school than I ever remember having. And maybe that sounds really horrible, but you know what I haven't had this year? I haven't had any suicides, um, successful. Um, so, so I'm okay with that. I would rather a student go get help because they are in crisis and have parents that recognize that they're in crisis. Um, we have SROs on campus that can, you know, do that evaluation. And I'd much rather have the student see somebody and have a professional decide that it's okay than to be ignored um, and not get the resources that they need. So again, I'm okay with Baker Act. If the system works and it's keeping students alive, then I'm, I'm good with that. Um, as far as like school to prison pipelines, I think that it's so very important that when students leave high school, they have a plan. And I remember years ago, there was a couple years where that was Dr. Jenkins's big thing was like, when she went to a graduation and she shook a student's hand, she would ask them, what is your plan? And she wanted them to be able to repeat to them, what is their plan? I think when students leave and they have a concrete plan, um, whether that is going to college or that's going to the job course, whether that's going to a technical school, to me, it almost doesn't matter exactly what that plan is, but to walk across that stage and say, I got my diploma, I have this next plan, this is what I'm gonna do, I've taken steps to make that happen, is crucial, I think, for that success and to keep students from floundering and then maybe you know, ending up doing the wrong things um, to, to get by because they didn't have a plan and they thought just getting a diploma was a magic piece of paper and that was gonna make everything okay, which we know it's not. Um, but, but it is step one. And, and so I think it's very, very important. And I know Michael mentioned earlier, you know, students have options. Um, we need to do a better job of making sure they understand what those options are both while they're still in school and how to take advantages and get those started while they're still there. Um, and then access to know what those resources are once they get out of school. Okay, thank you. I know that was a lot to answer in uh, two minutes, so. I know, I think I went yeah. over time on that one, but you gave us three things, so. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so that was all the questions that we had. Um, I, the, there, there are more questions in the questionnaire that uh, we would ask you to fill out. 
So Stephanie, I know you're listening in and you've been texting me the questions off of Facebook. Do, do I have everything or I have everything you have curated? Is that correct? Yep, you've got it. Okay. So I think some of this you all have addressed already. So um, why don't we do this? Do, do you think a minute, minute and a half to answer these questions? Fair? We haven't heard the questions. Yeah, that's true. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So as a school board member, what does the education portion of the Florida Constitution mean to you? I, I think we addressed that in the first two questions. Yeah. Do, do y'all have anything to add on that? Nothing's coming to mind. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I don't think we uh, addressed this. And, and this is a good one. This is a, a two minute response. Um, do you feel that many parents are unaware of the processes that the school board engages in? And how would you suggest educating parents on what the school board does and the procedures in place for parents to lodge a grievance? So um, Heather, I think you're first up. Are parents unaware of school board processes? How would you educate the parents and um, about what you do on the school board and the procedures in place if they want to complain? So I would say probably a lot of parents are confused of exactly what's entailing there. Um, I think a lot of people in general don't really know what the school board does and, and which decisions they weigh in on and, and what the role of the school board is versus like, let's say the superintendent and, and all of that. Um, how do we address that? I mean, like many things we educate, we provide opportunities for parents to get involved. Um, one of the things that um, really keeps coming up to me as I talk to different community members is that I think there is a disproportionate of people who are not native English speakers who really feel like they don't have the same access to understanding of how systems work. So not only do I think we need to educate our community, and I know Orange County does various like parent um, workshops on the weekend and they have different topics that they cover and, and maybe this could be a topic that's addressed. Um, but I also think, you know, providing um, this in, in multiple languages. So, you know, obviously we have certain languages are spoken, you know, heavier in our, in our communities and in our county and, and making sure that, that we offer um, some of this information, not just presented in English, but, but have it presented in Spanish, um, you know, have it presented in, in Haitian or Creole or, you know, whatever it is that a community needs to make sure that not just some parents are understanding and getting access to information, but that the bulk of our, our families are. Okay, um, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, and, and, a, and a word on it, and I think this is one of the biggest problems we have. You know, it's not just an Orange County problem, but it's probably just a human being problem is uh, engagement. Um, you know, parents aren't aware of <laughs> all of the intricacies of the Orange County uh, public school system. You know, one of the one of the programs they had before COVID, I think they suspended it uh, with COVID, was Leadership Orange, where they would let a group of uh, adults uh, into Orange County public schools, and they would basically go through a, a multi-week course where they'd learn a little bit about discipline, they'd learn a little bit about busing, they'd learn a little bit about food services, and by the time they were done, oh my gosh, not only do they know a lot about how our county works, but they become advocates. Uh, so where they can talk with other parents and kind of be the experts and share that knowledge. The problem with the program, it was designed to let a very small group of people in that were select instead of kind of opening the door and be inclusive and allowing more parents that are interested get involved with that. And that's one of the things I'd wanna look at that program expanded to where more parents, more everyday regular people can actually you know, look underneath the hood and see what's going on with discipline, how do grievances work, 
What do the school the school board members do? What do they what what does a superintendent do from day to day out? What does their responsibilities look like? I think we need to reform that to where we can let more people through and get a better education about what the school district does. Okay. And I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Actually, I think I see two that are related. So maybe one minute answers to this. Um, the, the first question is, how do you feel about the time school board meetings take place? And, and actually, I'll combine and give you two minutes to answer. It's two different questions. How do you feel about the time that school board meetings take place? And are you in favor of live streaming pre-agenda public comments? So Michael, we'll start with you. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna we'll break that up. The, the first um, question is very obvious, yes. I think we need to push it back to ensure that more people, teachers, people who work, people who have to get their kids and are caught in traffic, we, we need to push it back so more people can come and be involved. That's a no-brainer. I know there were a lot of other reasons why they say uh, the school board meetings are the way they are, uh, but um, I, I would be in favor of pushing back. Your, your second question is one that I struggle with a little bit if I'm candid. I like being as transparent as possible. I like the idea that from beginning to end and even before the beginning, the public can view and see what's going on. And that's idealistic because the reality is a lot of those pre-meetings have been hijacked <laughs> and turned <laughs> into something that they shouldn't be. And so that's where I struggle. So I would want to keep it, I'd want to broadcast it, but I'd really want to chew on some safeguards to minimize the shenanigans uh, that go on before the school board meetings start because it gets counterproductive, it's a, it's a circus. And, um, but, but I always want to be transparent, you know, even though that's a circus, that's our circus. And so I think at, at a certain level, we need to see that, but we need to put some, some guardrails. So uh, we, we minimize some of the shenanigans that come in uh, before the meeting starts. Okay, go ahead, Heather. Um, I, I would also agree that the time makes it very hard for everybody to fully engage and participate um, even to watch, even if they just want to watch the live stream, if you're still at work, you know, that's still hard, um, whether it was actually going physically to the meeting or not. So I, I also would be in favor of, of a later start time. Um, as far as the live streaming, uh, I too really believe in transparency. I guess I'm a little optimistic that I think if more people saw that, um, that pre-time, um, and, and the circus that sometimes it is, maybe we would have less of that. Maybe people would be so offended by how the time is being wasted that other people would be going down there to sign up to talk to make sure that the right things were being addressed and discussed you know, during that time. Again, maybe I'm being a little optimistic there, um, but I could only hope that it could be better because um, I agree in, in some of the times that I've watched, um, I'm like, what is happening here? Um, but. I feel like it can only get better, right? <laughs> um, I, I got to tell you, I went to a number of different county school board meetings uh, during the fall when mask mandates were, um, were, were being discussed. And in Hillsboro, we do, you know, unlimited public comments. They're all live streamed. If there's a bunch of people, they'll cut you down from three minutes to two or one minute. But everyone who signs up gets to talk and it's streamed. Um, in Palm Beach County, it was three minutes, everyone. Cool. Like, and, and it went on for hours. And then they actually had a hotline that you could call in and then they would play your hotline comments during the meeting so that they would go out live. Like it took hours. And, and then there were, everything in between. Um, I think in Volusia County, um, you got to sit down. Like, I was like, wow, you, you get comfortable to, to make these comments, which, <laughs> yeah. Um, the, I, I thought it was one size fits all and it, it is not. So there is, uh, there's room for that, for, for, for y'all to come up with a different policy. Um, 
I, I've looked through all the questions and I think that there was one last question, but I think y'all addressed it. It was about academic integrity and intellectual freedom. Um, but in light of, I think, stop woke and don't say gay, um, the, 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 the person said the governor's edicts, um, uh, they were linking it to the possibility that um, organizations like College Board might remove AP credit from some of the classes. Um, I, I, I'm guessing, correct me if I'm wrong, you would be against that, right? <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, I, I guess I'll just, I would be, but I would also say uh, the positive side to that is I'm a big fan of a uh, dual enrollment. So uh, <laughs> there, there, there's some, there's some uh, silver uh, lining in that, but, but yes, I'd be against it. Go for it. Okay. I think we've gone through everything. Stephanie, one last check with you. Um, I, I think I've covered everything. That there's got to be a better way to do this without actually surfing Facebook myself, but I, I think we're good. So, um, and we're at an hour and a half. So I think it's a perfect time to give you two minutes to sum up and to give campaign info. If you've got surrogates or, um, or, or if you're doing it, drop your links and everything. Two minutes to sum up and talk about your campaign. And Michael, we'll start with you for the sum up. Okay, I was just typing, thank you. Um, you know, uh, I, I think I talked about it in the beginning, you know, for the last 20 plus years being involved in education and uh, again, seeing my kids uh, benefit from uh, the education they received from Orange County Public Schools, I, I feel like I've learned a lot and I wanna share that knowledge. I wanna be an advocate and an asset in the community. When you're talking with parents, there are a lot of parents that are very engaged and those parents are good. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of households where you know, the kids, the families, the dynamics there, um, it's not the same. And so I'd wanna be very engaged in the community, uh, making sure parents know what resources are available, making sure kids know what resources are available and something that you know doesn't get talked in a lot of uh, uh, candidate uh, school board forums, but really, really listening to the kids. I think the kids have, they're brilliant. They've got the ideas. Uh, they just need to be listened to. Uh, and that's the one thing that I think uh, a lot of us, a lot of us are, are, are missing or needed to be reminded of periodically that, hey, these kids are, these kids are pretty smart. Again, my website is votemichaeldaniels.com. I'm running up against uh, someone that literally I feel would send our school district back a couple of decades. And uh, I wanna fight against that with everything I've got. So uh, for anyone that's watching, if you can help, please do go to votemichaeldaniels.com. Thank you. Okay, Heather, two minutes to sum up and talk about your campaign. So um, in summary, I would say that, you know, I am running against a few other candidates as well. I believe what separates myself from the, the field is my experience. Experience as a parent, you know, sitting in from that perspective, experience as an educator, um, experience in the schools still um, as a school counselor. Um, and I believe that in doing all of those things, I have a unique perspective. I am able to see things from a lot of different perspectives. Um, my day-to-day -day job is really to be a natural mediator to all the different stakeholders and, and find common ground. And I think that those skills will be um, well used at the school board. Um, the other thing that I can honestly say is that for me, this is all about love of public education, um, defending our schools. Um, this will be my full-time job. It's not something that I'm going to look at as a part-time job. This is what I will do. This is what I will give my day-to-day -day time to. I will be in my schools. I will be in my district. I will be available to my constituents. I will be available to people who contact me. Um, that, is, that is what I want. 
Um, and, and so that is what I'm doing. I'm not using this as a stepping stone to another office. I'm not doing this to enhance my position in any way. It will be a pay cut for me, but it's something that I feel really passionately about. Um, and that's why I'm doing it. And so please support me. Um, I believe my information was dropped in the chat. Apparently it was. Um, so uh, you, you can see the links there. Please connect to my website, Facebook. Um, and if you can spare a dime, donate. Okay. Well, um, Heather and Michael, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, uh, hopefully it wasn't too bad. An hour and 34 minutes. Um, it was awful, Scott. It was awful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <laughs> If you go through the primary and there's a general, maybe we could do it again and we'll be better at it next time. So um, uh, I would ask um, the candidates to hang on after we stop the live stream so we could just uh, wrap up. But for everyone out there in Facebook land, please check these candidates out. Please check out the Democratic Public Education Caucus of Florida. Follow our Facebook, our social media, and please hit up our YouTube channel. If you've missed any of our programs, um, they're on the YouTube channel. And um, it, it, if you're watching this on a tape delay, you're probably watching it on YouTube or Facebook uh, uh, like a day or two later. Excellent resource. Uh, we're trying to talk to the candidates and elevate some issues because it is important August 23rd is when school board races are voted on, which means uh, vote by mail ballots are out in mid to late July. So we're under literally under two months before people start voting for school board. So um, uh, I know the candidates are, it's a two month sprint, two and a half month sprint right now, but people are waking up, talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, let them know that to vote for public education. Um, public education today is our economy tomorrow. Um, and, and all of us have a stake in this. So good night, everyone. We're going to end the Facebook Live. And uh, candidates, if you could hang out, I would appreciate it.